Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, to uh, the uh, GFAR webinar on basic search engine optimization, um, a topic, as many topics as we have tackled in the previous uh, webinars, which is very close to my, uh, my heart, uh, which very often sounds much more complex than it really is. Um, first, a word from our sponsor, of course. Uh, this webinar is organized by uh, GFAR, uh, the Global Forum on Agriculture Research. Uh, during this webinar, uh, the man behind the scene is Charles Plummer, who will manage the slides and the chat Q&A. He will also be the policeman um, who will uh, mute your video and your audio. So there is no, there is Charles. So there is no um, reason um, for anybody except Charles and me to be on uh, on video. Um, um, my name is Peter, Peter Casier. I will be guiding you through the content. Charles and I both work for the GFR Secretariat and we manage uh, their um, social media and online uh, media channels and projects. Um, a small word on, on the logistics of this webinar. For this webinar, we're all connected through um, uh, BlueJeans, um, a webinar service uh, which allows everyone to see the presentations and the speakers. Um, Feedback, tips, and questions should only be done via the chat box. It's a little chat icon on the top right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we do this um, and keep your video and audio muted because otherwise it will suck up a lot of bandwidth from everybody. And we'll be hearing everybody's background noise in their uh, offices, which is really disturbing. Uh, but even though we are with a big group, uh, still I would like this webinar to be as interactive as possible. So I do encourage you to send us remarks, suggestions, and questions during the presentation itself, using the chat box. Um, during the webinar, we will stop at regular intervals to check for your chat input. So whenever you have a question or a suggestion that pops up in your mind, just type it uh, right in, in the chat box, and we'll go over the stack of uh, incoming questions and remarks during the regular Q&A breaks. Um, in this uh, webinar, I split up in uh, different uh, chapters, so we'll do a Q&A break after every chapter. After this webinar, I will also send you a mail uh, with a link uh, to the recording of the webinar and some links to websites or resources that I mentioned during the webinar, or possibly also some answers to questions I couldn't answer during the webinar itself. We run for about an hour and a half, two hours, depending on the amount of questions that you have. I'll mute my um, video now and see if Charles is ready to start the presentation. Just one moment. Sure. Very good. Thank you, Charles. Look. Okay. Yeah, that looks perfect. Thank you. Um, next slide. The uh, the structure of the webinar. Um, I've split it off in five different uh, chapters. Um, first, I want to take a step back before we um, um, talk about search traffic and search engine optimization. I want to illustrate a bit why search traffic is is really important for a website. Um, then. We're going to go closer to our goal. We're going to have. We're going to check how uh, to uh, to check for search uh, traffic and the statistics that we get from uh, search traffic. And then to understand how to do search engine optimization, we need to understand how Google ranks, finds, and interprets content uh, on your website. Based on that, knowing how Google interprets our content, then we can look at how to get better search results. How do we tweak our website, our pages, or uh, our blogs? To get uh, better search results. And then the last short chapter is about um, what I would call the art of web mastering. When we have all of the search results, what can we do to convert those accidental, those incidental um, uh, search visitors into returning visitors? We go to the next slide, uh, Charles. So if we look at why search traffic um, is so important, 
be it for our website or for our blogs or online repositories? Well, it's very simple. It is the most important single source of traffic on your website. And that's something that people don't really um, um, uh, realize. If you go to the next slide, um, next slide uh, Charles. Um, if we look at an example from our environment, this is a typical um, website from a, a typical nonprofit uh, agriculture organization, a research organization. The site has about 1 million page views per year. And they do a pretty good social media and, and um, email marketing. Um, the organization is pretty well known. Um, and they have a good na navigation. So if you look at their traffic from over a year, uh, what do we see? In all of the traffic of all of the incoming visitors that we receive on this website, 59% comes from search engines. These are people who search for some content, found the link um, in the search engine with our website and clicked on that. That is the incoming um, uh, search traffic. So the organic search typically would be between 50 between let's say 40 and 60 percent of all of our traffic now if you look at um, a little bit of details next slide uh, charles in in figures um we see that in those traffic patterns and if you look at specifically at the difference between the search traffic and the amount of traffic that the social media channels for instance generate then we see for this website a typical pattern the search traffic is about 10 to 20 times higher than the traffic you get from social media. And remember, this example is from a website where they do a pretty good social media outreach. So then for yourself, you should really compare the time and the efforts you spend on managing your social media channels, your Twitter and your Facebook and your LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera, compared to the time that you spend on tailoring and optimizing your search traffic. Purely on traffic figures, we should spend 10 to 20 times more efforts on search traffic than what we spent on managing our social media channels, simply because the traffic that we get from search is 10 to 20 times higher. Now, I do not know any organization that does this. Most of the time, hardly anyone spends any time um, on the tailoring and the even the monitoring of search traffic. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's because it's not clear how important this search traffic is in terms of your total volume. But also very often it falls in between the cracks of responsibilities between webmasters, the technical people, and the content generators, mainly the communication staff. Next slide, uh, Charles. But there is more. It's not just the volume of search traffic, which is important. Um, so search traffic is not only the highest in volume of any traffic um, from a single source on uh, your website, but it's also the highest in quality. And there's a big difference between volume and quality in, in um, search traffic or in general web traffic. Typically, as we see here, the search traffic has one of the lowest bounce rates from all incoming traffic. The bounce rate is the percentage of people who come onto a single page in your site and only read that single page. They don't click on a second page or a third page. They basically bounce off. So in a way, um, in a future uh, webinar, we'll look at how to track the website statistics, but the bounce rate is one of the most important figures when you analyze your web traffic and your uh, traffic quality. Next slide, uh, Charles. Let's look at those bounce rate figures a little bit more into detail for this particular website. So knowing that for bounce rates, the lower this figure, the better it is then you can see search traffic is the second most valuable type of incoming traffic on your site. About half the visitors that come onto your site via a search engine also look for other content on your site and click on at least one other page. Also interesting is look at the difference of the bounce rates between, for instance, social media and search traffic. When people click on the link you publish on your Twitter, on your Facebook, on your LinkedIn account, only 33% reads another piece of content. They come onto one single page that they have found on your Twitter and your Facebook, and that's where it ends for at least 67%. Uh, Only 33% clicks on another page. So the quality of the traffic that we get via the search engines is very high. It is very precious traffic, and we'll come uh, back uh, onto that topic uh, later. So two things to remember. 
in this chapter um, why search traffic is important. It's important as a volume, as a source of traffic to your site, often 10 to 20 times more important than your social media channels, and it's very high quality traffic. People are typically interested in reading more than just a page they have landed on coming in from the uh, search engine. Um, this is the end of the uh, first uh, chapter. Let's see if, uh, although it's early on, if we have any uh, questions coming in already, um, uh, Charles? No questions yet, no. Very good. We're early on. So don't forget, guys, this uh, webinar and the usefulness of this webinar comes on your questions and remarks and tips. So please keep them coming. Next um, slide, uh, Charles. <clears throat> so we looked at why search traffic is important. Now, how do we check for search traffic? Next slide, Charles. We're going fast here. So how well is your site doing in the search? Well, there's two ways to look at it. It is retroactively. Uh, it is looking at the statistics. For instance, Google Analytics or building statistics. And then we're going to look at the actual search. When we search for things relevant to our um, website and we mimic a standard web user, um, how does our site um, uh, behave and what can people find? Um, Next slide. So in the statistics, we already looked at it in the previous chapter. In Google Analytics, as we discussed, how much traffic do you get? I can tell you if you get less than 40 or 50% of search traffic compared to the total traffic you have on your website, then there is something wrong with your site. You should not have less than 40 or 50%. Um, so that's where the search engine optimization uh, comes in place. Also check uh, for the bounce rate. Um, search traffic should be one of the least bounced traffic sources. If this is not the case, then typically there is something wrong with your navigation or the teasers that incites people to read more pages. And we'll come back to that later. Next slide, uh, Charles. Now, Google Analytics is the main traffic analysis tool that we, that we use, that most of the people use. But I know that many of you, for instance, use WordPress.com or other externally hosted versions um, um, of blogs, for instance, Blogger um, or Tumblr. And WordPress.com does not allow you to integrate Google Analytics into your site. So, but even here, like in WordPress.com, we can find some basic statistics which are built in into WordPress.com. This is a screenshot uh, from uh, statistics actually coming from the GFAR blog, uh, which runs on WordPress.com. Here again, you see, if you look at these figures, that even for our blog, our search traffic is four or five times higher than the social media traffic. And again, this is for our blog, which we heavily market on the social media channels. So a final note uh, on this, as we mentioned in the previous webinars, keep track of your statistics, but not only as an absolute number, as one figure. More importantly for these um, statistics, be it for the search traffic or other uh, statistics uh, figures, keep track of the trend. So see if the traffic is going up, if your search traffic uh, is going up, if your bounce rates keep on going down. This means that you're in the right, that you're actually doing um, um, stuff which um, helps your site. Um, Peter, next slide. excuse me. Yes. We have a couple questions and a remark. Um, um, I'm, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll save switch it for later. Q&A, um, um, uh, Charles. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll stop at, uh, at, at the Q&A right after this, um, um, uh, this chapter. Okay. All right. Now, that was just traffic. That is more retroactively, is monitoring what's going on with our search traffic. How many visitors do we get? What is the bounce rate? What is the quality of our search traffic? Now, of course, we need to be proactive. So how do we check how our site behaves in a search engine? So. Um, what we do is, well, we try to mimic a search, just like an ordinary um, uh, visitor, uh, a web visitor, a web searcher would do. So for instance, if we would do a search for nonprofit agriculture research, this is on the screen what we get. And yay, CGR features as a third most prominent place. So if I would be the webmaster of CGR.org, for me, that would be an excellent result because the search um, that I do, nonprofit agriculture research is really key for um, uh, for my site. Um, meanwhile, 
Aston, if you keep on uh, muting your video and your audio, please, otherwise we're going to consume too much um, bandwidth. Thanks. Now, let's do a, a search. Next slide, uh, Charles. Let's do a search on, for instance, agriculture research in added areas. If I'm Icarda, this would be one of my main keywords, agriculture research in added areas. And here again, I can see Icarda is featured on the fourth place of the first page, which is a pretty good result. For me, as long as you end up on the first or second page in the search results, you're doing well. If you're hidden in the third page and beyond, you need to do better. Statistics show that if you're featured lower in the third, fourth page, and so on, you get far, far less search traffic. So in search engine optimization, one of our goals is to be featured high up when people look for keywords which are relevant to our work. But I challenge you to do this exercise for your main projects, not just for general for your site. Agriculture research and arid areas is fine to try to see how Ricarda is featuring, but try to find um, um, projects uh, and, and by entering content keywords, not by project name or the name of the, the project scientist, but do it by content. See how you are featured in, for instance, trying to find research on per millet in Africa or climate smart villages in Zambia, or for instance, world rise production statistics, anything that relates to specific projects um, and are topics that, would, that people would probably search and you want to lure them into um, uh, your site. Now it is often, and you, you can do this quite detailed, it is often you know, easy to get baffled how often your websites do not get featured prominently the moment we go deeper than the general keywords which are typical for our websites. So do keep in mind though, when you try to mimic an average um, uh, searcher, um, uh, a Google user, um, is that Google searches are customized. So if you want to um, test this and you want to try to mimic an average web visitor, how do people find my, um, my web traffic? And let me try to mimic um, that typical uh, web searcher. Make sure you are not signed into Google. So log out of Google because Google presents search results for you based on your previous searches and clicks. Um, but even if you're not signed in, Google can look in your past browsing history using the cookies that um, uh, websites drop into your browser. And these might be quite extensive. Google also uh, shows results based on your geographic location and language. We once uh, actually did um, a test by having several people at the same time, we were online on Skype, and everybody Googled the same keywords and looked, compared the, the, the search results one to another. And it was interesting to see how the search results differed for the different parts of the world. Also, when you use the Chrome browser, make sure you're not signed into your Chrome browser because again, Google searches will be customized based on your Chrome browser history. Um, also do keep in mind um, that Google often mixes search results with advertising and they're often criticized for that. They're often pushing sites who pay for ads um, higher in the search results. But still, we can get a pretty good view of how people find um, um, our content uh, by typing in keywords, uh, typing in things that typically people would look for when um, they try to find our projects or where they should end up on our website. Next slide, uh, Charles. Um, now, this is for a general web search. Now, we can do the same also for images, for an image search. If I do minutes in Africa, this is the results that I get. And very often or already here, this is where people start to hampering, where websites start to show how inefficient they, they are. It's very rare that on websites, people curate their images to make it easy searchable. So in here, minutes in, in Africa, we saw the search result, and I think it was for Ikrisat, who has um, uh, projects with minutes in Africa. They were featured for, um, quite high up. Here on the search results, we can see that they already start to be featured uh, further down. Next slide, uh, Charles. You can also do this um, um, search for uh, videos. Now, as you will see for videos though, most of the top listed videos will be from YouTube. Uh, why? Well, it's simple. Um, uh, YouTube is owned by Google and they often prefer their own content. But at this point, let me point out the snippet information. If you look at search results, you see a title, you see the URL, 
and you, sh you see a short description on narrative. Now, this is what we call snippet information. This is the most relevant information that Google could find for your search item. And it's true. If you do a web search or an image search or a video search, that snippet information is what Google found as the most relevant related to the um, search um, uh, qualifiers, the search items. So for, Im uh, for videos, for instance, as we have in this example, it's pretty easy. And thus, it's also easy for you to manipulate. It's very easy to see where Google finds its relevant information. For YouTube, it simply takes the title and the description of the video as you have entered it in YouTube. That's why um, for the people who participated in a previous webinar, we, when we stress the importance of tweaking your YouTube videos, your titles and your descriptions, unless if you put a significant title to your YouTube video and put a couple of paragraphs of descriptors which um, describe what, what is in the video with the relevant keywords, people will never find your video. If your video is called uh, 1234.mp4, and you leave the description blank, people will never ever find your video. Now, if you look at that snippet of information and how Google finds your content for images, it is slightly more complex and time consuming. And it will come to, um, back to that in, in a moment. But when you do a full web search for pages, actual content pages, that information in a snippet is really significant to figure out what Google has crawled and picked up as the most relevant information for its search. Now, in the art of search engine optimization, it really comes down to tweak or tailor our content in such a way that we make it easier for Google to find the relevant information. So search engine optimization is nothing else in tweaking our content and the mechanics that Google is using to discover our content so that Google finds our content easier based on keywords, based on relevant information. Now, to be able to tailor that content, we need to understand how Google finds, interprets, and ranks content. That's for the next chapter. So, Charles, on to the next slide, the Q&A. I think you had some questions for me. Okay, yeah. So, we had Daisy asking if you could please repeat what you said about 40% as a way of checking the health of your uh, search engine optimization. Okay, very good. I tackle that first. Um, Daisy, when um, you go and use a look at your Google um, Analytics and you look at the overall traffic patterns, you will see um, the big families uh, of uh, the origins of traffic. You will see um, uh, the direct traffic, which are people who typed in a direct URL. They typed in uh, worldagroforestry.org. Uh, they typed in cgr.org. This is direct traffic or the direct traffic uh, going to a particular blog post. You have referral traffic, which is traffic that comes in onto your website <clears throat> when people click on the link on a third party site. You have your social media traffic, you have traffic which is generated by email. Um, the organic search part in there should be minimum 40 to 50% of your overall traffic. If it is less, then this means there is something wrong with your search engine optimization. Any website or any blog should at least have from the total um, uh, website traffic, from a total visitor traffic, should at least have 40 to 50% of organic search. Uh, oh, next. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome, Daisy. Uh, Charles? Okay, the next question we have is from David. He says, uh, about the search engine stats, does it factor in bots? in the search results? Uh, no, uh, that's a good question. Uh, see, David is a webmaster. Uh, no, this is live human traffic. Um, bots um, and um, uh, bots, robots that scan and crawl the website um, uh, are not included, um, um, simply because the, the Google Analytics um, is a script and bots don't execute scripts. So this is live traffic from live visitors. This is box, uh, bots excluded. We cannot see bot traffic or robot or automated traffic um, uh, in our Google Analytics, uh, neither on the WordPress.com statistics. Next. All right. Um, would my IP address influence my Google search results? Uh, yes. Uh, through your IP address, Google knows um, where you are geographically. Um, it will also know the language of that region. Um, so Google will tailor. 
these are not major differences. For instance, you will not have a, a website like CGR.org featuring on the first um, uh, three top search results um, in South America, and they would be on the last um, uh, uh, four pages uh, of the search results in, the, in Asia, for instance. But there are variations. And it's not often that we can see websites um, migrating from the first to the second page, for instance. So yes, it is based on your IP address from which Google knows where you are located um, and automatically knows um, uh, what would be the main languages which are spoken at a geographic location. So it will be based on your IP address. That's correct. Next, Charles. Okay, and the last one I have for right now, um, Epiphany says, I'm not a savvy web developer. Can I add Google Analytics to my blog and website myself? Any tips? Uh, yes, you can. Um, some of the content management systems make it very easy. Um, so they have uh, somewhere a feature where you just put in your Google Analytics uh, code. Um, to explain you um, uh, very shortly, step by step, so Google Analytics as a tool uh, from Google, you need to sign in with your um, uh, Google login. You need to tell Google which the websites are that uh, you want to monitor. For that, you need to be the webmaster, so you need to have physical access to the website. Uh, the next step, Google verifies um, whether you're actually the webmaster, so they will give you a little bit of code which you need to put onto your website or your blog, and then it verifies whether you have put the snippet in there. So the link is made between Google Analytics and, um, uh, and your website. Uh, so it is not really difficult to do. I do understand if you would be a general content generator, um, um, press officer, it might be a little bit um, uh, more difficult. Uh, but in there, I would uh, I would suggest that um, um, somewhere you get help from your webmasters. Um, they will do it in one to three. It really takes nothing more than uh, than two minutes to enter the Google Analytics uh, statistics in in a website or a blog. Do remember though that some of the tools that we use to publish. Um, we call them content management systems, do not allow you to put the Google Analytics in. They're very limited. And these are typically those that we do not host ourselves. WordPress.com, not WordPress.org, WordPress.com or Blogger or Tumblr, um, uh, where it's a little bit more difficult to do. But even those would have built-in uh, statistics tools. I do encourage you, if you manage um, a blog or a website, do use Google Analytics. It is, for me, one of the key sources of information that we keep track on to see how well we are doing. Next, um, Charles? Uh, that's all the questions uh, we have for right now. OK, excellent. Uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, Charles. I'm trying to follow here from. Oh, wait, there's another question that just came in from David. When I drill mm -hmm. down on the organic search, the biggest percentage goes to not provided keyword. Any idea what that is? Um, that is that would be a keyword the, where Google Analytics could not um, trap um, uh, what keywords were actually entered. Um, um, if you want to do a real analysis um, to um, what the keywords were that people um, uh, use, David, then I would suggest that you use Google Webmasters, which gives you a further breakdown of the, um, the search qualifiers. Uh, and I'll come back to uh, Google Webmasters in just a moment. Uh, there's also a tool to link Google Webmasters um, with Google Analytics uh, to get better overview of the search keywords in Google Analytics itself. But we'll come back to um, 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 Google Webmaster as one of the tools to uh, monitor and enhance our web traffic in just a moment. Yeah, Charles, shall we go to the next um, chapter, Charles, and the next slide? Yes, we can. We can go. I'll mute my, uh, my video again. And keep those questions coming, guys. This is what makes um, a webinar uh, interesting, is to tailor it to your needs. So we looked at why search traffic is important. We did a quick check on the search traffic retroactively by looking at statistics, proactively in trying to mimic a web visitor, trying to search for content for which we want him or her to end up on our website or our blog, now become where the rubber really hits the road, is how does Google rank content? How does Google find content? How do, um, uh, does it find the relevant content? How do they relate it over to our website? So next slide, uh, Charles. Well, there's basically two principles that Google is using. It is off-page search engine optimization and in-page search engine optimization. And this might be Chinese for most of you. Off-page 
is anything that happens outside of your own website where you have less direct control on end pages, more what happens within your website and within the page. So knowing these two bits of information, let's try to decipher that Chinese um, and see how we can tweak and how we can influence. When we look at off-page search engine optimization, stuff which is happening mostly outside of your web page, then we have to talk about page ranking. Page ranking, basically off-site search engine optimization in three words, is page rank minus penalties. Now, many of you will start frowning and uh, scratching your hair. What the hell does it mean by that? Off-page search engine optimization is page ranking minus penalties. Well, let's look at that in a detail. It is not really rocket science. Next slide, uh, Charles. Page rank. What is page rank? Well, very early on, in the 90s, when the web was created, Google was founded as a search engine. That was their main first business. The main challenge they had, though, was how do we qualify what is important on the web and what is not? What is noise and what is relevant content? Which web pages are the most relevant for any of the user search queries? And in the 90s, we did not have the zillions of web pages as we have now, but still it was already in the millions. So PageRank, what they invented as an algorithm used by Google Search um, to rank websites in their search engine um, um, uh, results pages. So PageRank was named after Larry Page, uh, one of the, uh, the founders of Google. Um, so PageRank was a way to measure the importance of individual websites, websites and individual pages. Now, PageRank works in principle, that's how it all started, by counting the number and the quality of links to a web page to determine a rough estimate of how important the website is. So the underlying assumption is the more important a web page is, the more likely it is to receive links from other websites. If I'm FAO.org, lots of people will probably refer in hyperlinks to content which relates to my content much more than if I would be John Doe blogging on a personal blog. So it works a bit like, for the scientists amongst you, a bit like citations. The most relevant scientific publications are often referred to as the ones which are the most cited by other publications. So the most relevant websites here are the ones which are the most cited or the most linked to by other websites. So in basis and how PageRank started in the 90s, it was just a mere calculation of the amount of other websites um, linking to your website. So it is a logarithmic scale from zero to nine, ranking the importance of your site. The more sites that link to your website, the more relevant your site is considered by Google. Thus, the higher the page rank. Now, let me correct, it, correct this a little bit. It is not just the amount of sites that link to your website, but also the amount of high value sites. As you can understand, um, a site of a much higher page rank linking to you, for instance, FBO.org, which has a page rank of eight, if they link to your website, this is seen as Google as much, much more valuable than the link from somebody's personal blog who puts a hyperlink in to your website and which might have a page rank of one or two only. So it is an, an algorithm, a sum of all of the websites that link to you, but not just in mere numbers, but to calculate a certain value to each of those websites. So the more website um, links that you get uh, from external sites, from high value sites, the better. Now, this is back in the 90s. It was in principle a well-documented and a reasonably simple algorithm to define the value of a web page. But very soon, as Google became prominent in the search engine business, and people started to see the value of search engine traffic, people started to cheat. And they started to cheat with spam sites and created artificial incoming links. They were selling links. So Google gradually, over the years, refined its algorithm up to the point now where it's one of the industry's best kept secrets. So now, in short, we can summarize that your site's page rank, the value of your site, according to Google, is based on the amount of incoming high value links, links from high ranked sites, minus a number of penalties 
that Google has built in, trying to penalize those people who were trying to break the algorithm by putting in spam sites and spam links, et cetera, et cetera. So those penalties are not only based on those cheaters, but also in a way that Google has tweaked the algorithm in a way to avoid general spam on the web and in their efforts to make the web better. So they will penalize you. Um, for instance, if you get links from um, spam sites, they will penalize you for excessive reciprocal links because very early on people said, hey, Dear Mr. FAO.org uh, um, uh, webmaster, what if I put a link on or several links from my website to you and you put then several uh, links from your website to me? So people started to exchange links. It's like you know, kids um, um, uh, trading uh, uh, sweets. But this was back in the 90s. Now it became more sophisticated. You're also penalized for basic bad web management. If you have a slow site, you will be penalized and your value of your page rank will go down. How many bad and dead links do you have on your website? And we'll come back to that later. So how many hyperlinks do you have on your blog or your website, which basically are dead links, end up to an old URL which doesn't exist anymore? How many coding errors do you have? Is the way that your website has been coded, is, according, is it according to the web standards? Is it compatible with mobile browsing? Google penalizes your website if your website is not compatible with mobile browsing. Why? Because more and more people start using mobile browsing. Is it secure? Do you have any links to malware? If you ever get infected, the first thing you have to do is get the infection out because Google will detect your malware, your infected links, um, in less than a week. Do you also have links to suspected or hidden advertisements? These are all ways that starting with the page rank being the amount of, of websites, how you value your websites linking to your website, they started to subtract points. And the more bad points, the more penalization you get, the lower your page rank is. So you might have a, a, a good website, a good in terms of referred to by many other websites, but if you have a lot of dead links, if your website is slow, if the coding is really bad, not according to the standards, you might end up with a low page rank. Um, we'll come back to that later, because of course, this is one of the ways to tweak it. But one bit of heads up here, the penalties are often technical elements, something many of us as non-technical communicators do not understand and cannot see. Um, you cannot see that on a website from the looks of it, if the search engine optimization was done properly or not, how good the coding was, etc. This is often why we as communicators are fooled by web developing companies. You know, it might look good, but underneath the hood, it really might suck. That's why when you ever work on a website revamp, and we'll talk about this, um, uh, Antonella will talk about this in the next um, uh, webinar on website revamps, you need to work with content generators as well as technical people. Because your technical people from your organization can look under the hood and see what those web developers are actually doing. Um, if it is standard to the W3 standards, but also how well do they do search engine optimization? And yes, it is possible to make a website which looks good, is fast, and is of zero value for search engines. For instance, um, for the technical people amongst you websites, I've come across websites which are completely made in JavaScript, uh, which might be easier to code, it might look much more sexier than a standard website, but for a search engine optimization, the value is zero. Uh, because search engine crawlers don't go into scripts. So there is no way for search engines to see what your website is all about, to detect your, uh, your content. Next slide, um, uh, Charles. Now, <coughs> back again to page ranking. Um, um, I did a, a survey um, of about 800 nonprofit blogs a year ago. And this is from page rank zero to nine, the, um, uh, the logarithmic scale of page ranking, how those 800 nonprofit blogs are distributed in page ranks. So most of the blogs, as you can see here, are somewhere between a page rank three and six. Now, um, if we, this is for blogs. If you would do this for websites, typically websites would have slightly higher figures, where most of the websites would be in the page rank five to six. In the follow-up email after this web webinar, I'll give you um, a link to a website that uh, um, calculates your page rank for your site. So if you're a blog and you have somewhere a page rank of three to six, you're good. 
I would say if you're a five or a six, you're really good. Um, if you are a website rather than a blog, probably between a five and a six, that should be your target in terms of page ranking. Um, next slide, uh, Charles. Now, this is the external uh, X page um, um, uh, search engine optimization. Now, a combination of trying to get as many links as possible from high quality sites, but also making sure that our website technically works well. Now you have the end page search engine optimization, which basically is based on two categories of, of data. Um, and this is almost as important as the external search engine optimization. Um, and often people stop at the off-page search engine optimization, trying to push for a high, um, the highest possible page rank, but only doing that doesn't work. We might have a website with a lot of high quality incoming links, which is fast, well curated, technically working very well, not a lot of dead links, but that doesn't mean that Google will find our content which is relevant to its search. So what is important here is to remember that the Google crawler, the robot, which every day searches zillions of websites around uh, the world, that machine, which scans all of those website contents all of the time, mimics human behavior. It scans a web page as if it were a human and tries to interpret what is important on your page and what is not. It is the important stuff that gets indexed. And this is very often the, um, that important stuff what, or what the Google search crawler finds as important stuff that is searchable and where people can find our site, our content, our pages. So what do as, as humans stands out when we look at a web page? Well, that's also what Google looks for. First of all, it's a title, of course. Then secondly, it would be emphasized content and um, um, added to that meta tags. So emphasized text, this is what we see, what stands out in a, um, um, and, and a page is what is bolded, what is in italic, what is in color, what is in high, what is highlighted. Uh, it is also text of your links. But beyond that, Google also looks for meta tags or metadata, which is hidden information specifically meant for search engines and not for web visitors. It is not something that we as a web visitor will see, but what the, uh, a crawler, uh, the Google search engine will interpret. So those things and we'll look at it a little bit more in the detail together with the keywords that um, the crawler finds are indexed by google and this is what google finds as the most relevant uh, content so probably one of the most important pieces of information here would be content title or the page title or the blog title and then from here even taking this as one of the most important pieces of information um, we go into a dilemma and I'll use this as an example to go a little bit further into details. What is appealing, and listen to me here, what is appealing to a reader, to a web visitor, to a human, might not be appealing to a crawler or to Google. For instance, too hot for chocolate. Next slide, uh, Charles. Too hot for chocolate is a typical example of a blog post that I often use when I um, um, uh, give workshops on how to write good blog posts. Um, it is a typical a title that uh, for a reader, um, a human reader might be enticing. Um, I see it as a good title for um, a blog post, but for a crawler, like a Google crawler, it is not meaningful. Um, so too hot for chocolate might be fun, exciting, short, to the point. The blog post might be light to read and has all of the information I'm looking for. But for a search engine, for a crawler, the title too hot for chocolate, while interesting for a reader, is not really interesting for a crawler. If a crawler sees this, probably um, it will get confused. Well, it will get confused. Um, Google will not understand easily that this blog post is about cacao production and the influence of climate change on cacao production. And probably you'll find it easier uh, to find in the search results when you search for hot chocolate and dentist rather than climate change or cacao. So if only we could separate what a web visitor sees in the title, and what the crawler sees in the title. And this is where search engine meta tags and metadata come in. Uh, next slide, um, Charles. Most of the self-hosted websites, Drupal, Typo7, self-hosted WordPress.org, allows you to tweak the titles, differentiating what a web visitor sees, the visual title, and what a search engine sees. 
as a title. So it is often built in the search engine optimization tools to give a specific title and a description uh, to a piece of content is either built in in the content management system um, or you can add it as a plugin. In, um, in WordPress, it's added as a plugin. So with the search engine tools, as you can see here on this screen, you can add a title and a description, but it's a meta tag and a meta description. It is not something that a typical human visitor visually sees on the web page, but it more accurately describes your site and your page content with more significant keywords, specifically geared for the search engines. So with search engine optimization tools, we can differentiate what is intriguing for a reader as a title, what is intriguing for a web visitor, such as Too Hot for Chocolate, which is the actual blog title, and what the web crawlers need as information. So a typical title that might be more interesting than Too Hot for Chocolate for a search engine would be, for instance, new research shows impact of climate change on cocoa production in Colombia. It has all of the keywords that we really need and what the blog post is about. Uh, it is about research, it's about the impact of climate change, it's on cacao production, and it's in Colombia. Um, now, if we would use that, of course, as a title for our blog post for the, the web visitor, new research impacts, um, um, so new research shows the impact of climate change on cacao production in Colombia, oh, this is really boring. So that's why with a good search engine optimization, we can differentiate making exciting, for visitors, for readers, and making it significant for the crawlers. And with that meta information, the search engine metadata of the title and the description, what is only visible for the search engine, um, these are what we call meta tags. So in principle, every page on your website should have a title and a description meta tag relevant for the search engine, or at least those pages where the title of your blog post or the title of your page might be might seem ambiguous for the search engine, such as to hot for chocolate. So the art here is when you try to see how a search engine sees your title is to read the blog, this time not with the eyes of a web visitor, but with the eyes of a search engine. Um, if it is confusing, then you should add a separate search engine meta tag. Note, however, that in some uh, web publishing platforms, which are not self-hosted, such as WordPress.com or Tumblr or Blogger, they do not allow you to tweak these meta tags. So here you're stuck with really the web visitor title. But most of the content management systems that we all use allow you to do that. So in here, one of the arts of good in-page search engine optimization would be to look at those pages with those titles which are not significant for a crawler, and tweak those titles with meta tags, giving it a web crawler title and a web crawler description. Next slide, uh, Charles. Um, and you can not only do this for, um, um, uh, for pages, but you can also do this for images. This is a, a, a snapshot, a screenshot uh, from the meta tags that we can enter uh, on pictures. Um, so you can understand if you upload a picture to your site with the name dsc12307.jpg, without a caption or description, there is no way that Google can understand what this picture is all about. Um, and here we lose quite a bit of traffic because picture search traffic, image search traffic, becomes more and more important as a source of traffic. And somewhere I think it's because more and more content is being generated worldwide on the web. So people, more and more people look for more and more illustrations they can use. So what we um, need to do is what most web platforms allow us to do is when we add a picture, upload a picture, we also add an alternative text and a description for this picture, which might be short. I always use the same text for the description and the alternative text. So as metadata, I can give a search engine a friendly description for what the picture stands for. For instance, instead of using DSC12307.jpg as the title of the picture, I can use um, you know, something like um, rural farmer in Zata district, uh, Ghana, with Frisian dairy cattle. Pull with, with, uh, with keywords that we want people to find our image on. Ruler, it's about rural farmers, it's Zata district, it's about Ghana, it's about Frisian there, and it's about dairy cattle. So um, um, the meta description, alternative text, entered that when you um, upload a picture onto uh, your website. So 
Apart from the blog title, as we covered, also the picture metadata um, helps Google discover what the web page and what the images are all about. Um, just a short summary, blog title, most important. Then anything on your page which is emphasized, um, which is put in bold or italic or is put in color, or the text that you use to link to other content, the text that you use for hyperlinking. This is what a visitor sees as the most important um, a content that uh, that stands out. That's also what the web crawler sees. Now, if you need to delink um, your web visitor title, what the crawler should see, then we use uh, metadata. We use a crawler um, um, title and only for crawlers, and we use a description only for crawlers. So all of that is in-page uh, search engine optimization. So combine the two. And again, what is really important to understand is not about trying to push only about trying to push our website with as many possible external links pushing our uh, page rank higher up. I have seen examples where the site is technically well constructed, um, a site which had a page rank of eight, but where these, the end page search engine optimization was not done well. So Google had a real hard time to find what each of the pages were all about. It had a hard time trying to find the relevant keywords. It had a hard time to index your, your traffic. And their traffic was very low, even though they had a page rank of eight. So what they had to do is tweak the in-page search engine optimization. Haha, <laughs> hopefully now the Chinese is a little bit um, uh, debunked. Next slide, uh, Charles, and we go into a next Q&A um, session. Okay, so we only have a couple questions right now. So if anybody wants to write some more in, I'm watching. Um, the first one we have is from Sammy. He says, are we focusing on Google because it is the most used search engine? Does everything also apply to Bing and or Yahoo? Yeah, um, a very good question. Um, the Google traffic is uh, by far the uh, most used um, uh, search engine. Um, we can see this if you look at, uh, at the sources of the, um, uh, the search traffic on, on any of the websites that somewhere I've come across or I monitor, the Google traffic is by far the highest traffic. Um, so that's why I mostly um, work on optimizing the website uh, for Google. It's true you also have Bing. I'm not, too, I'm not too sure. I don't think you really have the Yahoo a search engine anymore, but you have Ask Me and you have specialized search engines. Um, I always work from the principle, if I can optimize my website for Google, nothing that I do is very specific for Google, but I know how Google works, which is somewhere also the algorithm that many of the other search engines work. So if I optimize my website and my blog for Google, I also automatically have uh, optimized it for other um, uh, search engines. But keep in mind the majority if not almost all of your search traffic will come from Google. Okay. Next step, Charles. Okay, so how do we technically diversify our titles to reach both engines and human readers? Yeah, that you do with the example that I gave with um, a search engine optimization tool, which for many of the content management systems that we work on is built in, which allows us to give a title um, visible to the web um, uh, visitor, to somebody who looks at our web page, and give a different title and a, and a short description um, uh, for the crawlers. So it is done via a search and um, um, an SEO plugin or an SEO tool built in in your content management system. That's how you delink the two. This is not something you can okay. do on WordPress.com. Amy asks, uh, do web crawlers take image titles, caption, and description into account? Any other information? Yeah, um, they use, um, uh, so the, it's a title and the alternative uh, text. These are two fields you can normally enter when you upload a, a picture or incorporate a picture on your pages, but also the caption, and I didn't talk about caption. Um, so if um, a caption is linked to um, your image, Google will also relate that image to um, um, the text in, in the caption. Um, however, the caption is again something which is visible for the user. So I'm not telling you to add captions to all of your text. Very often I find the captions actually pretty disturbing. Um, but if you add captions in um, uh, for a picture visible for the user, make sure that also the crawler sees it. However, it is the title and the description which is most uh, relevant uh, uh, for images. 
Yes, Josh. All right. Do we have any, any more? more questions? Anybody? All right. We go to the next uh, chapter. Uh, so Daisy, oh, sorry, yes. Peter. <laughs> Daisy says, is it, is it enough to just name the photo? Not um, sure what yeah. she means. So, so Daisy, um, uh, you're working with WordPress, for instance. It is good enough um, to, um, to name the, the picture, but with something which is, which is descriptive. As my example, it was, uh, what was it? Uh, a uh, farmer in a uh, chat um, uh, district in northern Ghana with his uh, Frisian dairy um, uh, cattle. Um, so I would use the title and the uh, alternative text, the alt text, um, uh, as keywords. Again, it is not something that the user sees um, by default. It is only something that the webcrawler sees. And that is good enough. If you only upload a picture, and the picture's title is um, um, the title of the file that you upload, dsc12307.jpg. Google will never, ever be able to understand what this picture is about. All right. And Jerry says, does the raw URL also work for web crawlers? Can you tweak it for search engines so it's not just a replication of the title? Um, it is the raw URL. Uh, which is used and displayed. Um, and here we go a little bit, what I wouldn't call the um, basic search engine optimization anymore, but more the advanced one. Um, if you're in advanced search engine optimization, I would encourage you to use a canonical URL. This is a URL which is not, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, worldacroforestry.org slash uh, question mark page equals one two three etc etc which are very often the default uh, URLs when we work with content management systems we would actually give it a URL which has in the URL itself which has the keywords what this um, web page or blog page is all about um, so it is not possible to when Google displays a URL to tweak that and display it differently but what you need to do is when you publish um, on your website, on your blog, before you publish, you tweak the URL so it becomes canonical. So it is actually readable text rather than figures. Um, it is so more important and significant for search engine optimization, but it's not really basic search engine optimization. So use canonical URLs. What Google displays as URL is the physical one on your page, yes. All right. That's it for now. That's all we have. Okay. Very good. Um, next slide, Charles. So we looked at um, um, why is search uh, traffic import, the traffic uh, volume and the quantity and the quality. Sorry. Um, how does um, how can we check for search traffic retroactively through statistics and proactively mimicking a typical um, a user, a typical searcher? Uh, we looked at how Google ranks content by X page and N page, uh, so off page and N page um, uh, search engine optimization. Now, in this chapter, I want to look a little bit at how to get better search results. Understanding now how Google um, ranks my web page and my individual content, how it discovers it, how it tries to find the most relevant um, um, uh, content, how can we tweak, how can we get better results from the search engine? Uh, next slide, uh, Charles. And I'll start with the first tip, which is not something that people typically relate to search engine optimization. The very first thing that I would do, and I always do when we uh, start launching a new website, is to, yes, Charles, the next, uh, the first line, <clears throat> is to submit and monitor our site to Google Webmaster. And yes, Bing has something similar. Uh, Google Webmaster, next slide, uh, Charles, is a free tool um, which I found being a webmaster extremely useful. Um, it allows you to monitor Google's activity on your site. So what is being crawled? How frequent is it being crawled? Um, what typical pages are being searched? It also shows which website is linking to what content. So which external website is linking to what content um, on your site? It lists the typical uh, search uh, keywords that people use 
um, um, and discover your site. So you can understand um, the keywords that people type um, 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 for new users discovering a site, but it also analyzes the quality of your site, which is somewhere related to search engine optimization and somewhere uh, related to good, to good website management, good um, uh, web mastering. So um, Google Webmasters um, tool um, analyzes the average speed of your site. It analyzes crawling errors. It analyzes linking errors. Uh, like here on this example on this screen, you can see that um, uh, on that particular website, we have 22 links in the whole website, which is not bad. 22 links which are dead, uh, that Google could not find the URL that I hyperlinked to. Typically, this is old content referring to uh, content on external websites which doesn't exist anymore. They took it down. Um, and as you know, many of these quality qualifiers for a good website are also the uh, related to the penalties that Google gives um, um, to your website, bringing your page rank down. Um, so with all of those um, uh, qualifiers, we're not only looking at a good quality site, but also reducing the penalties, increasing our web traffic. Uh, if you haven't looked at um, uh, Google Webmasters yet, and that you can use for almost any content management system, um, I strongly encourage you that. There are some really, really technical and in-depth things in there, but it, it gives a good overview also in general of how people discover your content. It, it is a tool to discover dead links. It is a tool to discover actually what search um, um, visitors are doing on your site. Next slide, uh, Charles. And of course, what, I, um, what is interesting, remember to PageRank. PageRank was related to how many websites are linking um, to, uh, to my website. So it gives you an overview of the total links um, from external websites. Uh, so in here, you see this particular website that we're looking at has a total of 140,000. Um, and this is a PageRank 4 website, by the way. It has a total of 152,000 incoming links, and you see um, uh, which websites are linking um, the most um, to our um, uh, website. So that keeps, uh, um, helps you a little bit of tracking who is hyperlinking from their website to yours. Somewhere, if you have sleepless nights, I go into the details and actually look what people wrote about my website. You know, what did they write around the hyperlinks that they link to my website, which is always um, uh, an interesting thing to do in the sleepless nights. Um, next slide, um, uh, Charles. So it's not only about submitting it to Google Webmaster and monitoring it. Um, there are, of course, lots of other ways in getting better uh, search results. Uh, next click, uh, Charles. I want to stress this again. And almost in any webinar or workshop that I give is very often we concentrate on technical tools to tweak but it really all starts with good content. Content is king. Um, this is probably still the main qualifier for a good website beyond all of the search engine optimization tips and tricks that I covered in this webinar. We can somewhere technically, through good search engine optimization, lure people via the search onto our site. But if our content, if our content is average, it's not really worth it. Good content will also spread much easier, will be linked more. So it all starts, and this is an encouragement again for you people who are not webmasters, not technically inclined. It starts with you, the people who actually write content. It starts with good content. Next to click, uh, Charles. But of course, you also need to help with your basic um, site SEO. It is not all about writing good content. So basic good site SEO, make sure that your site has a proper title and a proper description for Google, which is done with search engine optimization tools. Make sure your code is clean and your site is fast. And then when you go into more work, try as get, uh, to get as many mentions on external websites as possible, as many incoming links from third party websites and as many as possible high quality links. So if I would start a blog tomorrow, I would, the first thing I would do after the blog is, is finished and I have some content in there, I would submit it to the Google Webmasters um, and 
I would start doing some basic search engine optimization and trying to get people from external high value websites such as cgr.org, unicef.org, un.org, um, cgr.org, et cetera, et cetera, to link to me. That will pop up my, my page rank and pop up my, uh, my volume. Um, now, in here, when we talk about good basic site SEO and good basic content and page search engine optimization, where we try to, to have people link to our website, something which is really, really important when you manage a website and a blog for an organization. That is, in principle, you should never change your site URL, nor the URL of your individual content pages. So let me repeat that. You should never change your site URL, nor the URL of your content pages. Why? Well, simply, if we encourage, and also it grows organically, if your website has been on the market for five years or for 10 years, you will be linked by tens of thousands of other sites. Now, if you revamp your website and you change either your basic URL, and I will give you the example of, we went from egfar.org to uh, gfar.net last year. I'll, I will tell you what the, uh, what the consequence was. Now, <clears throat> a part in the, the uh, revamping, even if you leave the main URL, <clears throat> for instance, gfar.org or worldacroforestry.org, if you keep that, very often when people change content management system or they revamp the website, they break the URLs. And the new, the new pages, the new block uh, pages or the new web pages would have a different URL. This means that with one click where you activate your new website, you basically break all of the hyperlinks coming into your website. So this means that anybody using your old URLs from a third party website and clicks on that will end up on a dead link. Also internally in your site, where you often refer to other pages, within your site, and that's what you should do. That's a good way to tease people to read other content. All of those URLs would be dead. So in principle, you should never, ever, when you revamp your website, when you tweak your website, change either your main site URL or your content URLs. You will, use, you will lose massively in search traffic, as basically Google hates dead links, and they will, in a week, they will discover that most of the people linking to your website are linking to dead links. So your page rank will go down, your site will be penalized. Um, we'll also tackle this and the art of when you revamp your website, not the art of not breaking URLs and preserving your old URLs. We will cover this um, in the art of website revamps, which is the next uh, webinar. Um, and we'll have one of our um, uh, champions of website revamping, Antonella Pastore here and she will explain how you can technically preserve the validity of um, your uh, page urls a practical example um, last year uh, we were running still up to july um, the gfar website was called egfar.org now between um, you know all 50 of you listening and uh, and me um, we needed to change the url simply because um, where the URL is, is managed, the domain uh, management system was not under our control. And those who managed it uh, refused to change um, uh, to our new physical site. So we had no other way than to re-register a new domain name um, and start from afresh. So with one click, we went from eg4.org to g4.net last year, about 13 months ago. Now, the release of the new website while it was done 13 months ago, still to date, we have not recovered. Still to date, our page rank is still zero. While we had, I think, a page rank of five 13 months ago on the old um, um, uh, domain. Um, and our search traffic today, 13 months after the revamping and changing all of our URLs, is still a fraction of what it used to be. It's, it, it basically takes years to build up um, um, that um, search engine traffic. So, next uh, slide. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, um, Charles, sorry, you're already there. So, make sure you also do your, your basic uh, content and page search engine optimization. So, in there, 
when you put um, 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 titles and um, descriptions to pages, make sure you do it um, consciously. Do not spam the description and the title with keywords because Google will detect when you try to um, um, artificially um, insert um, a lot of keywords into your title and description. So do your basic content and page search engine opt optimization, distinguishing for those pages who have titles which are totally insignificant and irrelevant for search engines, give it a good search engine optimization title and uh, description. And then as we covered, um, metadata for images. Uh, make sure you upload it with a good title and alt uh, text uh, for your images. Um, in all of it, Google is getting quite clever. And while in the early days, it was pretty easy to cheat um, and to put artificial links to a website and spam our website with hidden keywords uh, that the visitor, the web visitor does not see, but the, the, the crawler sees these days, now the Google um, crawler, as well as the Bing crawler, has become very sophisticated. So it becomes really, really difficult to cheat. So in there, I would uh, encourage you with the good content, make sure you have a good conscience on search engine optimization. Next um, slide, Charles. I think we're going back again into a Q&A session. Go ahead, Charles, do you have anything for me? I have one question from Dax, which you kind of touched on, I believe. He says, is it advisable to buy a URL if your blog is on WordPress? Would it be easier to find in search engines if you remove WordPress with you know, the reference to being a WordPress URL? Um, the way that um, there's two, two answers to that, there's two parts to that question. So yes, if you're running on WordPress.com, um, you can buy, but actually you don't buy um, a, a domain, you hire it <clears throat> from a domain supplier, such as uh, godaddy.com, for instance. So you can rent a domain name, uh, daxagriculture.org, for instance, um, and you can link that uh, to your WordPress.com. Uh, to be able to do that, I think you need to pay WordPress.com, I think it is $99 per year uh, for them to make the link. Um, so yes, even if you don't host your uh, blog or your website yourself, you can still um, uh, use your own domain. It's the same on Blogger. Uh, instead of um, um, having your website uh, um, something daxagriculture.blogspot.com, you can also um, uh, rent um, a domain and link. It's the same in Tumblr um, also. So yes, in WordPress.com, you can uh, rent a, um, a domain and have, uh, while you're physically run on WordPress.com, you can actually have a customized, uh, customized domain. The example here <coughs> pardon, is blog.gfar.net. So this is uh, um, um, uh, on our domain, but actually physically this blog is running on WordPress.com. Um, so you can put that mapping in there. And it costs about, I think it was $99 per, uh, per year. The second question from Dax is, would it, um, make it easier uh, for Google to discover your content. I wouldn't say to discover your content, but somewhere <clears throat> it is rumored that Google values um, um, uh, blogs which are running on, for instance, blogspot.com or under the URL uh, wordpress.com lower um, than other content. Um, why is this? Well, it's pretty easy to explain. I mean, if you really have a high value site, you most probably, as an organization, for instance, and you run this blog professionally, most probably the first thing you will do is put this blog and website under your own domain name and not use the default blogspot.com or uh, wordpress.com. So it's somewhere um, understandable that Google would value those higher. How much that value is, I do not know. But I would say, yes, Google would um, value um, uh, your own domain uh, higher than a default domain like WordPress.com or Blogspot.com. Um, do also know when you change that. Um, so if, when you, if you go from WordPress.com or Blogspot.com, actually they will do the URL translation. So you will not be faced with the hurdle that we covered before. This is one. Also remember that it takes a long time for Google to adapt its page ranking and its keywords. So it's not because from one day you go from DAX agriculture.wordpress.com to dexagriculture.org. 
it is not from the same day or the next day that actually your page rank will shoot up and uh, uh, Google will uh, think that your site is more relevant than others. It is very gradually. Typically, it's every six months or a year that somewhere Google does an, um, an update on the page ranking. Um, but also, it takes a long time for Google to adapt and find the changes um, and to adapt the value of your site. So it is something which is of a long breath. Yes, Charles? Amy, Amy asks, uh, or she comments, I don't quite understand what is meant with cheating in terms of search engine optimization. Do you mean that it, you have too many keywords, including mm -hmm. the internal links? Yeah. The search engine optimization is a multi-million dollar business. So there are companies that um, do nothing else uh, taking your website and optimizing it um, in a way that your results are pushed high up on the search uh, engine results pages, something they call SERP, S-E-R-P, search engine results pages. Now, originally back in the 90s when Google had a very simple algorithm, but it was just a, a question of how many sites link to you, what is the value of those sites, those companies would cheat by running hundreds, if not thousands of websites, which are nothing else but uh, spam websites with dummy content that is scraped off somewhere from the web and where for a fee, they would put in a link from that website to yours. So this means that in you know a week's time, you would go from 10 sites that link to your website to probably 10,000 or 100,000, depending on how much you pay those companies. This was the very early 90s and early 2000s way of cheating. You buy links, just like you know nowadays you can buy Twitter followers, you can buy uh, uh, Facebook likes, um, uh, you can buy um, um, Instagram uh, followers. Um, you could buy, and you can still do, but it's far, far less um, um, effective by external links. It's far less um, effective and it's even counter-effective because, because Google has ways to detect those spam sites. They can detect whether a site is filled with dummy content. So very simply, if they find the content somewhere else, this means it's duplicated content. So I would be really, really, really careful with that. Um, another way to cheat was people who run a website, um, and this is cheating um, uh, down in the years, when people run a real website, a real professional website, they would put in hidden links that the users, the web visitors don't see, but the chlorers see. So they would create lots of content, good content, but they would hide external links and they would sell those external links. So I would actually sell my real estate on my blog um, 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 to third parties. And you might think this is a, a, a rocket science or science fiction or, or I'm inventing things. I tell you there was, I think it was a year and a half ago when I did an analysis for one of the CGR research centers that I actually found out that somewhere in the history of years, somebody had injected hidden links in their site. Um, maybe there was somebody from a technical team who sold, who sold um, 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 uh, links, I do not know. Um, so th this was a way to cheat. Now, another way to cheat would be, as, as Amy said, yes, artificially putting in the SEO title or the SEO description a lot of keywords. Um, um, and a lot of, of repetition or variations of the same keyword. So it would have climate change, comma, climate change adaptation, uh, climate smart agriculture, comma, 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 all in the title. Google doesn't like that, uh, those repetitions. So these are ways to artificially cheat. Yeah, injecting keywords. All right. That's all we have for right now. Very good. We're going into the, um, we're right on time, into the last uh, chapter. Um, of the uh, the webinar, I'm switching off my video again, Charles. Voila. Um, yes, Charles. Click, click, click. We went. Um, why it is important? How do we check for traffic? How does Google discover content? Next click. Um, how can we tweak our stuff to get better search results? And the next click, fifth and last chapter is for me the art of web mastering. It's like the Zen art of web mastering. Next slide, uh, Charles. To me, the art of web mastering is to turn those accidental visitors we get 
from search engines typically into returning visitors. Here is something you really need to pay attention to because this is, I would say something what distinguish, distinguishes um, online media chickens from online media eagles. This is gonna say, oh, there he goes again with his chickens and his eagles. Um, we can... <laughs> I saw you frowning. <laughs> Um, now, <laughs> we, can, we can tweak all of the, uh, with all of the search engine optimizations and spend a lot of time in tweaking our site so our site becomes really well searchable. So when we invent any type of keyword, which is somewhere even remotely related um, to our site and through which we, we want people to find our content. When we tweak our content pages and give it what Peter says, SEO, meta tag titles, and we give all of the images a title and a description, we can do all of that and push our site really high up into the search um, 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 results page. We will, we will see an increase in search traffic. This means we will see um, um, uh, traffic on our sites. Now, you need to understand that many people that arrive from a search engine and click on the link from um, a search result that they found on the search engine pages, many of them are accidental visitors. Many of them are people who are not, um, who do not know our site or are not regular visitors to our site. And again, with Google Analytics, I can prove you that this is true, that most of the search traffic, incoming search traffic, are visitors who have not come on our page before, or certainly are not uh, returning visitors. So here you are, you have Alibaba's cave with all of the gold and glitter of search engine optimization. You're getting, you followed all of Peter's tips of um, getting a lot of search traffic. Now you need to capitalize on that. And you cannot leave it uh, to the fact that those accidental visitors only come to your website one time. The really art of webmastering, the Zen art of webmastering, for me is the art of turning those accidental visitors into returning visitors. So here you need to put yourself a little bit into the shoes of a person who for the first time in his or her life has discovered blog.worldagroforestry.org. Um, so how can we uh, turn, um, um, thank you Charles, you're following very well. Um, so how can we turn um, um, those incidental visitors into somebody who will, who will look at this website, scan through more content and say, this is something I need to remember. So the first thing is when we come in as, as a visitor who has never uh, found your website before, um, the first thing is anchors. And I'll talk a little bit, let me list them first. Um, we click through um, uh, jobs. The anchors are key elements to tell a user or help the user explaining what this website is all about and what we as an organization are all about. I'll go in, um, I'll give you an example in a moment. The second one is hooks. See as um, an accidental visitor coming to our website for the first time, discovering our website for the first time through a search um, uh, page. We see them as a fish and we need to be able to hook that fish and convert that uh, accidental visitor into a subscribed visitor. And I'll give you an explanation what I mean by hooks. The third one is of course, good navigation. I would not say only good navigation, but also make sure that your website has a good um, a look and feel and has good content, but purely technically a good navigation. If people cannot find content on your website, once they are on your website, you will lose them. And then the fourth one is teaser content. Um, when people come onto a page, one particular page. And remember, most of the people that do searches don't end up on your homepage, but actually end up on one particular blog post or one particular page. So keep that in mind when you design your web, um, um, your web um, uh, revamp, um, most of the people spend 90% of their time of web revamping on the layout of the homepage. Actually, it's not the homepage which is most relevant because probably 95% of your traffic does not go to your homepage, but to, to a particular blog post or um, a particular page on your website. So when somebody comes through a search engine to a page or a blog post, make sure that we present him or her, that incidental visitor with enough teaser content. Now teaser content might be, we have on the sideline, 
we have related content to this post, or we put internal links in the blog posts that people can continue to click and continue to delve into other content, or at the end of the blog post, we put a summary of where people can find more content. Let's go through this uh, one by one. First of all, it was next slide. Thank you, Charles. Next slide. The first uh, one is anchors. What do I mean by an anchor? Well, where does the terminology come from? See um, um, an incidental visitor coming onto your website. He, he or she does not know what your website is all about. They come onto a page for content that they have searched for. Now, if they have never seen your website or your blog before, they will need to know what your website is about and what your organization is all about. Um, so they will need to, to, um, to find somewhere an easy to find about us. The anchor terminology comes from the website, the newly um, uh, arrived website visitors, almost like ships um, um, going around in a wild sea. They need to find an anchor um, to uh, understand what this website and this um, uh, organization managing this website is all about. So the first way to convert um, a newly um, uh, or a first time visitor into returning visitors is make them feel at home, make them feel uh, comfortable. They need to understand what your blog, your website and your organization is, uh, um, is all about. So make in your navigation, make it very clear, make a very clear part which is about us and don't overwhelm them with a lot of information. Make the first page you know, very um, short and uh, to the point about you as an organization and what this website or blog is all about. The next one, Charles, would be the hooks. This is where we hook the fish. If we can bring a visitor in and if we can have this visitor sus subscribe to any of our outlets, then we have, we have converted this single time visitor into a returning visitor. And the hooks might be a range of items. If we have a newly visiting, um, um, uh, sorry, a first time visitor, and we get him or her to subscribe to our Facebook page, to our Twitter feed, to our LinkedIn or Google Plus, uh, to our um, 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 YouTube channel, but even more so, if we want, if we get them uh, to subscribe to our RSS feeds, and we covered RSS feeds in one of the past uh, webinars, or we can convince them to subscribe to our newsletter, then we have converted that first time occasional visitor into returning visitor. When they like our page, when they uh, subscribe to our Twitter feed, uh, our LinkedIn, when they subscribe to our RSS, to our email newsletter, uh, then we have a returning visitor. And that really, the hooks is, is an art by itself, not to overdo it, but this is the range of, uh, of, of hooks that you have. Get them to subscribe to either some of your social media outlets or to your inside uh, RSS feeds or newsletters. Um, next uh, slide, uh, Charles. We covered good navigation. And this is good navigation or just in general, good layout. It, um, if you have, even if you have good content, but if people get lost despite your anchors, they get lost within your content, they get lost and they don't know how to find other content or to find other parts of your website, then this is really an, a, a negative um, uh, value. Uh, and it's where we very often lose our, um, our visitors, be it returning visitors or newly visitors. Next one, uh, Charles. Um, next to the hooks and the anchor, most important is uh, teaser content. All too often, we present a blog post and it's very difficult for a first time visitor or returning visitor to find any related content. That's why I would encourage you, and there's plenty of tools in any of the content management systems that allow you to do that. In the side column, for instance, put something like what you see here on the screen, related content with a list of blog posts, which have the same type of content as the one that the person has just read. Or at the bottom of your post, of your blog post or your page, um, put, and you can put this manually, put a number of links. Um, here we can read more about this particular research. Um, download all of the, the full scientific um, um, uh, data uh, set uh, of um, this research. Download the full scientific article. View pictures from uh, um, uh, this research. Uh, more from the same author, et cetera, et cetera. So this is teaser content. People have landed on one blog post or a page. Um, and we tease them in also reading other content. 
if you have good content, the more content people discover. So the lower your bounce rate, the more they will appreciate your site and the more they will be eager in returning to your site. So these are um, probably the four uh, ways of converting the accidental first time visitor into returning visitor. The anchors, make them feel at home, know what this website or organization is all about, hooking them onto our social media channels, RSS feeds, our uh, newsletter, a good navigation and teaser content. Aha. So this is how we convert um, um, occasional search visitors um, and how we capitalize on all of the efforts that we've done on a good search engine optimization in converting these people into returning visitors. Next slide, uh, Charles. And I think we can actually stop the, uh, the presentation. And I'm going video on. All right, Charles, tell me, do you have any questions for me? Uh, Charles, I think you're muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> it was the mute button, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, Charles, go <laughs> Too ahead. Many buttons. Um, Amy Green asks, uh, a web designer told me that menu navigation is losing importance due to increasing mobile use and that navigation through content is increasingly important. Can you comment on your experience? Yeah, uh, yes, it's true. Um, mobile uh, browsing and browsing through mobile devices uh, um, um, is, uh, is exploding. Um, um, do know that very often also people um, put the tablet uh, browsing as mobile browsing, although very often the layout is very similar. Um, so the, the in-content navigation um, uh, becomes more and more important. This is something we did not have um, uh, before the explosion of, of the mobile uh, market. Um, so five years ago, for instance, it would already be rare that a website also has a mobile version, but nobody would um, uh, would pay attention in um, uh, with in content uh, navigation. Um, so I would say uh, do both. Uh, make sure that whatever you do on mobile, um, um, uh, people have a way of, of still navigating. Uh, um, while it is much easier to do this in a, in a good way on when you have a full screen. Um, on um, on a laptop or a desktop or on a full size tablet, it is much more difficult to do it in in a, in a mobile. I would still keep um, the navigation in in a mobile though. Yes, uh, it's also very interesting to see the the, the differences in typical traffic. Very often, mobile users <clears throat> would have a much higher bounce rate. So very often, mobile users would come to one particular page that they have found typically on social media. Um, and uh, read that, but not would not browse through other content. So it is a much more difficult public to convert from a, a, a single time, first time visitor into a returning visitor. Um, so once again, um, Amy is right there. And content navigation for mo mobile devices is very, very important. Um, I don't see any more questions at the moment. Okay, we had some, um, I think, uh, Charles, you, you told me some tips that uh, some people gave to, uh, to others. Yeah, um, a certain, and I'm going to massacre the pronunciation, I'm sure, Fisk Yavel, who Fisk -Yavel. may be dropping out because he says his, the blue jeans sucked all his battery. Um, but he's <laughs> been sending some useful links, um, how to check up on your SEO performance of your website. Um, he just sent one, uh, moz.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what uh, I can do, um, uh, Charles, is go through these tips and see if I can uh, uh, incorporate some or maybe find some uh, um, equally interesting uh, stuff in there. Yeah, they look so good. I, I think you should uh, yeah, note down these links that he's been sending. Yeah, um, I think you can. Yeah. Um, I think we we're saving the uh, the chat um, uh, also when we um, come out of the the, the webinar, uh, Charles. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, let me see if there is an, an easy way for me to select all. Did you see um, a common save feature in the the Blue Jeans tools? 
Uh, I'm looking. In any case, we would uh, um, lose the comments. Uh, we just write down the name. It's Javel. All right. Well, I've written down all the questions, so I'll now copy down these links. Okay, cool. Um, so Ogidan is asking if we can uh, save the chats attached to the um, to the webinar. <clears throat> ah, Fish Cavella has just emailed them to me. Excellent, excellent. Oh, Thank great. you very much. And sorry that um, Thank you. Uh, uh, Blue Jeans is exhausting your uh, your uh, your battery. It's the same here. I can feel my laptop uh, getting warmer. Um, Excellent. Thanks, um, uh, Fishkevel. Um, more. We also had guest nine who has a link to a great training. Um, let me see. Last chance for anybody. If anybody has any follow up questions. Um, what I will also send in the wrap up uh, email is, first of all, a link to the saved webinar, um, um, a link to web page where you can see your own page rank. Uh, where your page rank is calculated for you, but well, it's not calculated for you, is the check on, on Google what your page rank is. A link to the Google Webmaster and the Bing Webmaster tools. I will also send a link to um, a, a guy who works for Google um, and who is the head of their um, anti-spam search engine optimization team called uh, Matt Cutts. Um, he has a blog. Um, and this would probably be more for the technical people where he explains the ins and outs of the Google side of search engine optimization and how they are optimizing their algorithm, trying to avoid misuse and spamming and to present you with more um, the relevant links to the keywords um, that you type in. This is what you will get um, uh, from me. And then I'll, um, I'll go through uh, Fischkeville's um, uh, remarks and I can add them also in the uh, email. Um, that's it. I don't see any new um, uh, questions coming in. Charles, we're right on time. We said an hour yeah. and a half to two hours. Um, that's it from me. Thank you very much. I think in the peak we had 60 simultaneous uh, participants, which is, uh, which is really cool. Thanks very much for making it interactive with all of these questions. Charles, thank you very much for um, helping out. Your clicks sure. and um, um, your uh, swaps through the PowerPoint presentation were right on time. Can I hire you? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm already hired. <laughs> oh, you already got hired. Very good. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, remember, the next uh, webinar is on. Um, it's slightly more technical, but we also cover content um, uh, items. Is on website revamps, and we have the vamp of revamps. Um, we have Antonella Pastori uh, with us, who is um, a queen of um, uh, website revamps. Um, I had the honor of working with uh, Antonia on several occasions. If you want to know anything about Revamp, she, to me, is the go-to person. Um, so she will cover um, the process of website revamps, the pitfalls, and the opportunities during a revamp process, how to organize your revamp team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's within um, 14 days. Um, if, you want to, if you have not subscribed yet, hurry, because we're already over 70. Um, uh, subscribers for that webinar, and they cannot go higher than 100. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you again, Charles, and um, I wish you, you a good afternoon and a good morning. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody, and thanks for the feedback. Cheers.